Welcome to Casual Friday. So I want to start by answering a question that was left in the comments last week. Um, the question comes from a woman named Kat and she asked, could you tell us your top five books for stitch patterns, general techniques, and what you think makes a good book? First of all, uh, in terms of general techniques, I did do a video on general references a few weeks back, which I will link to at the top. You'll see that little information button and the, the name of the video will come across, but that information button will stay there for the duration of the video and you can click that at any time. Um, if you, whenever you decide you want to go look at that video, you can do that. Um, so I want, I'm not going to go, and I give the pros and cons of each of these general reference books. So if you don't feel like that is enough of an indication of what I think make, what I think makes a good book, <laughs> um, let me know. Uh, but I will answer the question about stitch patterns or st stitch dictionaries. And I don't think I can narrow it down to five books. And, and the reason why I can't do that is because typically if I'm using a stitch dictionary, I have in mind uh, something that I want to do. Like I want to make a sweater with cables on the front or I want to I want to create a set of fingerless mitts that have very delicate, uh, usually cables, but not always. Um, sometimes I'm just looking for knit pearl patterns. Occasionally I'm looking for lace. Uh, and then there are times when I'm looking for color patterns, like for stranded color work. And the different categories of what it is I'm looking for, it's going to take me to different books. So let me start off with just what I feel are, are really great general stitch pattern books. And these are going to be uh, texture patterns. So either knit pearl patterns, some cables, uh, lace patterns, that sort of thing. So I, I don't think it would it's going to surprise anyone for me to recommend um, Barbara Walker's Knitting Treasuries. I have her first treasury and her second one. I bought the second one years and years ago. Um, and it wasn't until later that I bought the first treasury. I, this is probably my all time favorite go-to stitch pattern book is the second treasury. First of all, it's huge. Uh, she added some additional sections that weren't in the first treasury and all around, I think it has more, a larger number of just more interesting uh, stitch patterns that maybe I wouldn't see somewhere else. The first treasury is still important and is still valuable. And the reason that I, I think it's important and valuable is that for any given category of stitch patterns, whether it's cables or knit pearl patterns or lace, she includes the most basic representative stitch patterns in that category. For cables, you're, that's where you're going to see rope cables. How, how does a rope cable work? Um, where that's an even number of stitches where half of them are crossing another periodically. So if you're brand new to cables and really like them, she's going to have that in this first treasury. If you're looking at lace, like really, really open lace, but fairly simple and repetitive, um, what patterns that are basically some combination of decrease yarn over, just alternating, but what they do on the wrong side, which decrease they use, whether they do the yarn over after the decrease or before, that kind of thing. Uh, those are going to be in this first treasury. Those stitch patterns, some people might call them mesh patterns, they have the name fagoting uh, stitch patterns, but those are going to be in the first treasury and they're not going to be in any, once she's done it, she's not gonna repeat it in one of her other treasuries. Now she does have, I think three or four treasuries altogether and perhaps it's the last one where she charts things out. Um, but these first treasuries, the, the photos are fairly small, they're in black and white and the patterns are all written. They're not charted. 
I don't have a problem with either of those situations, the fact that they're written out and the fact that the photos are black and white. There is, or perhaps was, that's maybe not still being updated, I don't know, but there was a project online called something like the, the Walker Treasury Project or something like that, where people would swatch uh, the stitch patterns from the books and submit their photographs. Um, they would say what needle size and what yarn they use. They don't, they don't include the instructions for the patterns. That's, that wouldn't be fair. That would be, that'd be really unfair. <laughs> uh, they're worth buying. Um, but you can see what, what those patterns look like um, when they're knit up in color and you can see them on a larger scale. Um, so that's one way of finding them out in color. The reason it doesn't bother me so much that these are written and not charted, even though I always knit from charts, is because I also always rechart patterns. So even if these patterns were in charted form, I would be recharting them on my own computer, um, combining them with other stitch patterns so I could see the entire layout of the, of the stitch pattern side by side. I typically chart multiple repeats um, of the chart vertically so I can get an overall view of it. And then I work from that. I print it out. Uh, I don't do it off an iPad. A lot, a lot of people, everybody has a different way that they like to work with charts or that they like to work with their stitch patterns. But that's um, what I do. And the other thing is even for stitch pattern books that I have that do have charts, often they're not charted in the way that I would want to use them. First of all, I'd have to reproduce them in some way, either photocopying or taking a photo and then printing it out or keeping it on my computer. However, I would have to find some way of reproducing that chart in order to actually use it in a project. So I don't mind recharting it. Now, depending on the complexity of the chart, it you can you can rechart these things pretty easily using graph paper or using a spreadsheet and just using basic typewriter uh, symbols. But if you're doing something like cables, which is what I really like to do, it's really helpful to have some kind of uh, program that will allow you to create uh, cable symbols for charting. So after the uh, Walker Treasuries, if I'm just looking through stitch dictionaries trying to get some idea, like I, I wanna make a sweater but I don't know what stitch pattern I want, I'm just like looking through stitch pattern books, then I have two others I look through. Uh, this one is still available. It's uh, the, new stitch, the new Knitting Stitch Library by Leslie Stanfield. Um, and I really like this one. This one does have charts in it, but the charts always take me a while to even understand. I still have to rechart them and they use kind of different symbols and different ways of presenting stitch patterns than I am really accustomed to. I just know that this book is a little different and that I have to sometimes look up the symbols to see what they mean. Cause these, these are only charted and do not have written instructions at all. So you can't compare the written instructions to the chart to confirm what you think you might know. If it's a really unusual symbol that only occurs in that chart, there will be, um, that will be included on the specific page. But if it's a symbol that's used throughout the book, then you're gonna have to find, look it up in the glossary. What I have found about this book is that often the stitch patterns have very long repeats. So they're things that you wouldn't want maybe to put on a hat because you would never even get through a whole repeat uh, in the course of a hat. But it might be something that you'd wanna do on a sweater and have really interesting bold design. So I really like these patterns, but they're not always suited, at least the cable patterns aren't always suited for the, the scale of what it is I'm knitting. It just really depends. And this is you know, another reason why it's you, one stitch dictionary is never enough. Every stitch dictionary has something about it that's really, um, really great and then it but it could be a disadvantage in other situations uh, what I this may be the first stitch dictionary I ever bought um, I probably bought it a couple of years after I started knitting and it's the harmony guide to knitting stitches and this is discontinued it's possible that it's available uh, online somewhere I use I, Harmony has you know dozens of stitch dictionaries and they have different 
combinations and permutations of some of the same stitch patterns in each of them. Uh, I really, I just, I really like it. It's got little color photos, only written instructions, and it's British uh, terminology. So sometimes you have to uh, take a look at how things are presented. It might say something like yarn forward rather than yarn over, for example. And this one does have some interesting color texture patterns, uh, like slip stitch patterns. It's just, it's a, it's a nice, it's a nice book. I always look through this book um, before I get started um, on things. It has, it does have a nice combination of things. Those are the four that I would say are my general go-to books that I really like a lot. Then I have books that I go to when I have something more specific in mind. So I do a lot of cables and there are a lot of different types of cables and certain uh, stitch dictionaries are gonna focus on those types of stitch patterns, those types of cable patterns where others aren't. So for example, here we go. I've got a couple of these Viking knits, okay. So I have two, these two books that are by Elizabeth Lavold. Um, they're these Viking knits. She created these types of cables that um, are closed cables. So they're the rope cables where they're, you know, two stitch wide strands that kind of move and travel, which is not something she invented. But she has a method of where you can just start a cable or end a cable in the fabric. And she has a specific way of doing this that lends it and because she's designing in a specific way where you are uh, usually when you're creating these these new ropes you're creating uh, you're doing a double increase between two existing stitches and then on the next row or two you do another two so you're creating these two stitch ropes in between existing stitches and then these ropes kind of go in different ways um, so that's one method of creating closed cables and they have kind of an elongated starting and ending point that some people don't like. And so they would prefer to do these kind of closed cables using the method that Alice Starmore created. I believe she created it. But that method is um, based on adding an odd number of stitches in between existing stitches. So the stitch patterns that you get are quite different and if you want to use one of those stitch patterns, um, but use the other method. My battery just died and I had to swap it out. So hopefully I can remember what I was talking about. So Elizabeth Lavold's method of creating closed, you know, open and closed cables is different than the method that Alice Starmer uses. And so when you're looking at these different types of cables, you have to keep that in mind and you can translate one type to another. It just takes some figuring. So I do, when I want to use something with closed cables, I'll look at the Viking knits. I look at Starmore's books. Um, I don't know which one it is. She's got one for Erin Cables. So I just tend to look through, you know, a, a lot of different books. Sometimes I'm looking through pattern books and looking at the cables that might be used in a, in a sweater pattern or a hat pattern or something and see if I can use um, that pattern and translate it to something else. The next type of cable pattern that I really like are these Bavarian traveling twisted stitch patterns. And those are these kind of delicate uh, cable patterns where you have a lot of uh, cables that are one stitch crossing another stitch. The knits are all twisted. The cables are crossing every round and um, they're very delicate. They were originally used in men's stockings and women's stockings and then as, as fashions changed, they went into vests and, and things like that. So they're a very traditional, a truly traditional uh, method of knitting, uh, which Aaron cables are not. That was sort of invented as a marketing strategy in like the 1930s or early 20th century. So, um, and because of that, Aaron, Aaron patterns became very successful, whereas the Bavarian traveling twisted stitch patterns were truly traditional and were at risk of being lost forever until a couple of, of women basically made a real effort to find as many of these stitch patterns as they could and to document them into books. So Maria, uh, what's her last name? Maria Erlbacher uh, created these uh, a set of three booklets um, 
and I there's no way on earth I'm going to be able to pronounce this correctly. Um, like Uber Leaf Fertage Strickmuster Austem Stirchen Einstall. <laughs> so it's basically it's traditional stitch patterns of the uh, is it Einstall Eins Valley? So it's like Austria Bavaria. There's this valley, this kind of area where these uh, stitch patterns were very traditional. And these booklets came out years ago, and they were sold by a museum, Schoolhouse Press in Wisconsin, which is um, Elizabeth Zimmerman's daughter, Meg Swanson, Swanson um, runs it. They often will get the rights to some of these really unusual types of books and have them printed and distribute them in, through their publishing company. And they did that with this series of three booklets, and it's been there. And it's been translated into English. There wasn't much to trans to translate. It's mostly charts, translated into English under the title "Twisted Stitches," "Twisted Stitch Knitting," something like that. But it's Maria Erlbacher, and it has all the same stitch patterns. There really isn't much information. She has a few actual patterns for stockings, but they're and, and they're charted in a very unusual way. They kind of explain how, how to read the charts. And again, so it's one of these things where I'm gonna rechart it because I have to think too much when I'm looking at these charts and they're existing on multiple pages. I'm usually taking them out of different booklets, this one and this one and this one, combining them together in order to create something unique. And um, there's, they, the patterns, the charts have to be re reproduced so I, do that on in my charting st software. I use Stitch Mastery's um, knitting chart editor because they have it's a huge, huge stitch library of symbols, but they are especially good with uh, with cables of all different kinds, including ones that represent twisted stitch patterns. They have a lot of brioche things. They have Estonian pattern uh, stitch patterns. She just came out with a new version. I haven't updated yet, but it's with. Um, foreign language libraries, I think German and one of the Scandinavian languages, I don't know which, but um, it, it's a really, and it's not that expensive. I think it's under a hundred dollars um, or around a hundred dollars, which for knitting tools seems like a lot of money. But now that I've been buying uh, spinning wheels and tools and accessories for my spinning wheel, I'm like, eh. <laughs> So those are, that one is available in English. Then the other set of Bavarian um, stitch patterns the, um, are also uh, available recently. Like they, they had been out of print for a long time. They were very expensive uh, at, by what the textile, it was one of the first times I ever checked out anything from the textile center uh, because they had these three books. And then the books were published uh, new and you get them in a set of three and they're called Barlish Stricken. Um, and again, they're in German and not only just German, but in the Bavarian dialect. So again, it's charted. She uses similar charts to how the Erlbacher books are charted, but different. Like she has her own symbols. And could, because these were all charted long before there was anything like software, they were doing these on typewriters to do the um, to do the charting. She's got some color photos in here, but what I love about this is that there is history in there. She talks about the history, but you have to be able to read German. So I spent a long time going through certain sections of this and typing it in to document and then going through Google Translate to try to see if I could make sense of what they were saying. And then I have a friend who is, a, she has a PhD in something, I don't know, but she, she, I think she can read Russian and German and I don't, I don't know what all, but um, I had her help me with certain sections just to confirm that I knew what was going on. Um, so these, these are three volumes, like three full volumes themselves and have some really amazing uh, stocking patterns in, in them. And so again, I go through these when I want to use these Bavarian Traveling Twisted Stitch patterns. I use um, um, Liesl Fandrell's books and Maria Albecker's um, books as well. Again, I told you there was going to be more than five. Then the next 
The next type of stitch pattern is going to be color and most specifically for me it's going to be stranded color work. It's not going to be intarsia. Um, those apparently those are available in Tarsha, you know, books, but, um, so I tend to go through, I have a couple of books on Fair Isle Knitting, and then I have a, a Alice Starmore book on, uh, charted charts for color knitting. Um, then I, of course I got my, I have my Latvian books that I bought earlier this year when I was, uh, taking the Latvian mitten class. I have, um, books on Norwegian. Um, mittens. I have Andean folk knitting. I have, you know, I just have a lot of these are primarily stitch pattern books. Some of them are like garment pattern books that include big stitch dictionaries. So that is something that I really look for. I, I tend to avoid these days, not my early days of knitting, but I don't buy a book unless I feel like there's a really good reference section in some way, either because it's got a stitch dictionary, because it tells the history of whatever it is this ethnic or traditional knitting style is, or it tells you how to create your own patterns using these types of techniques that are shown in the book. Something like that where there's, there's something where I can build my skills and not just knit the thing that, that they have you know, knit this pattern, knit that pattern, knit the other one. It's something that I can use to um, creatively myself. So I want to thank those of you who recommended the Wool in Spinning podcast. Rachel, I can't remember her last name. I should look these things up before I turn the camera on, but I don't. But it's Wool in Apostrophe Spinning. And her name is Rachel. She's Canadian. And she has a spinning podcast and it was recommended to me because of her sample cards because I was trying to figure out how I was trying to figure out a way to document what I was doing with spinning and several people I don't I'm, at least three people I think recommended uh, her to me and they were absolutely right to do so she's it was very informative and I learned something about helping to make my knitting more consistent just while she was doing her sample and showing how she goes through the process of, of deciding what she wants a specific yarn to be like. It was very informative. I was like, oh my gosh, a light bulb went off for me. So thank you. Now I am looking for other podcast suggestions, not for spinning and not for knitting, but for listening to while I'm spinning. So when I'm knitting, I'm usually sitting at my desk in front of my computer and I'm usually streaming something like once in a while I'll do a movie, but usually what I like to do is find a TV series that has a whole lot of seasons <laughs> to it and a whole lot of episodes every season that I can just turn on and that I don't really even have to look at. So often when I'm, I'm just streaming forensic files, I've seen every episode a million times. It's just talking heads talking about solving cold cases so it's not like you have to pay attention or you miss something it's just something to listen to um, but when i'm sitting and knitting in front of my computer i can see if i have an email coming on get notifications on things i can easily pause put my just put my knitting down and i could pick it back up there's nothing nothing to do that i have to worry about when i'm spinning i'm actually sitting in this chair but rotated this way and so I could listen to forensic files, um, but it's not, you know, when I stop my spinning, I have to, you know, there's things I have to do to stop. It's, it's a more, it's a bigger deal to interrupt. So I tend to be more focused for a longer period of time or for a set period of time or for a set amount of wool that I want to spin, um, which is quite different than knitting. And um, for some reason, I really like crime stories. <laughs> So my, my older daughter just, um, I've been talking to her about, cause she got interested in some of that too, but she listens to a lot of podcasts, but she turned me onto a podcast I've been listening to for the past few days called, now I'm going to re now I'm going to forget what it's called. Um, I have to go look. I could not remember what it's called. It's called Lexicon Valley and it's, it's a Slate magazine produces it. Originally it was hosted by two other different people, but now it's hosted by a man named John 
McWhorter. He's a linguistics professor at Columbia and he's done TED Talks and he's written a bunch of books and it's just really interesting because I really I really like listening to that you know talking about language I used to buy books on the English language there was a PBS uh, program years and years ago that had a book that went along with it called the story of English that I always found very fascinating so my daughter sent that to me and said I think you're gonna like this and I do they're like half half hour podcasts and which is a good amount of time for me to sit down uh, at the spinning wheel because I really need to get up every half hour I found that when I first learned to spin I was sitting for two I was so my body was so achy from the combination of knitting spinning writing and I just so much sitting and so having a podcast streaming from my computer across the room and then I have to get up and and then to to do something else and but anyway so I'm looking for podcasts that are not knitting or spinning related. Crime is great, <laughs> um, but it doesn't have to be. Just something interesting. Like I love This American Life and Radio Lab from uh, NPR. So those are the kinds of things that like real stories that I can really get interested in. I hate audiobooks. I hate, I can't express how much I hate audiobooks. And I think it's because, well, there's two reasons. One. I don't care how good the reader is, they, they never read it the way I would read it. And I end up thinking more about how they're reading than what it is they're saying. And also, um, I read at a certain speed. I don't think I'm that fast a reader. You know, I could read 60 to 100 pages an hour if it's a novel, um, which I don't think is that fast for, you know, someone who's a reader. Um, but reading out loud is a much slower process so it interrupts the pace of the book for me i feel like the book is taking so much longer and i just so the, the how long it takes and then the way people read i just can't stand it so i prefer listening to things that were written um for radio so they were they were written to be spoken aloud i much prefer that uh, and i can't listen at high speed my, you know, I've talked about my auditory processing in the past. My husband listens to things at two or three times the speed and he can process, he can process audio information as quickly as I can process visual information. And, um, and so I can't listen to things f super fast. It has to be at the regular uh, pace. So if anyone has any suggestions, that'd be great. So uh, this past week in spinning uh, was really interesting. I had, after my last spinning class, which I talked about last week when we learned applying, the very next day I had a fiber prep class. And I, I loved it. It was really good. We learned picking, flicking, carding, and combing. Uh, picking is like when you have the fleece and you have to, the, the locks of the, are all kind of clumped together and you kind of open them up, spread them out a little bit so that you can process, do the next step of processing. Flicking is you have like this little brush, like a wire brush with some tines and you're just kind of opening up those fibers a little bit, um, spreading them out with just with the aid of this little brush. I didn't actually try that. Um, I think it's something that people who spin right from the locks would do to open, open them up. Um, I, I just never got around to trying it in the class because I was doing, doing the combing and the, and the carding, and then I was spinning the, the, all the wool that I had carded. So he gave us, th it was really interesting. He was very thoughtful about how he chose the fibers that he gave us. He gave us three baggies full of fiber and they look like little sandwich bags. Um, one of them is down here. So he gave us, a uh, three of them. This one's not. So it's like this one was Icelandic wool, but then, you know, it's this little baggy and then, you know, you pull it out and it's like, it's this giant, you know, mass of, of fiber. It just, it just kept growing and growing and growing. Um, and so this is really interesting because this is an ancient breed. It has these long guard hairs that are waterproof and protect the sheep from getting wet and then it has this undercoat that's very downy that keeps them warm so it has these two types of fibers that are combined um, so that was interesting then he gave us a 
baggie full of Dorset down. And down, the down breeds come from a particular part of England they're called the down. I don't know if it's, they're called the downs, but it's this part of England. So it's like Dorset down or South down. So South down is the breed that was one of the first two breeds brought here to the United States in like the late 1700s, early 1800s. And that was the breed that they have at the Oliver Kelly farm that I've been to a couple of times this spring where they um, are like sort of dressed in 1860s attire. They have all the farm equipment. They, they're planting the crops that were planted then. It's the Historical Society owns this, this farm. And Oliver Kelly was very important to agriculture in Minnesota. Um, but they have the South Down sheep. And they originally were like an all-purpose sheep and um, meat and wool. And wool was in high demand. And so these Dorset Down sheep... Um, I think historically were similar. They were all all-purpose all sheep, and the the wool is is reasonably soft and it's like boingy. It's really springy, um, and but now they're primarily used for meat. So he, we had that fiber, and then the third one we had was Romney. Um, I have a little bag of that, and that's sort of somewhere in between in terms of the lock length and um, and is so we were trying these different. Um, methods of preparing the fiber. I have some, we learned, we learned to make row legs. So like I have a row leg here from my Romney and, um, it's got a little bit of vegetable matter still in it. The, the Dorset down had a lot and it still had quite a bit when I spun it. I spun all of it up that night. <laughs> I just sat there and that was part of the reason I didn't do flicking. It was like, I was so focused on just spinning up this, that, um, wool. And I'm going to practice plying with that next because I've got my new Lazy Kate that goes with my new spinning wheel, which I haven't tried it out yet. So I thought, well, I, I'm probably not going to knit with that particular yarn, but I do want to get through the whole process of processing from, you know, the fleece all the way through and um, just work on a sample card type of thing with those. So that was Thursday. Then on Saturday, I went up to this fiber co-op I had talked about last week. It's called Anoka Fiber Works. It's barely inside uh, Anoka. Um, and it's just a little square shop. And each section, of the, you know, there's four walls to the shop. And there's different sections of the wall of the perimeter uh, are devoted to different vendors. They, they rent a, a space in the shop uh, to sell their goods. Cause a lot of these people, it's either a hobby thing that they're doing or the only way they sell things is online. So it's a way people could actually see their things, you know, in person and they have a big mailing list and a Facebook page. So they get, they get kind of word of mouth that way. They, they get some notice that way. And then in the center of the store, they have these like um, fixtures, like a little turn, turn things. So one side of one of those fixtures could be something that a vendor rents at a very low cost to them. So the woman who runs the co-op also is the vendor that sells spinning wheels. So I just kind of took a look at, she, she had different spinning wheels than the woman who I bought mine from. Um, but it was fun to just kind of look at them and see, see what it was. So I why and the reason I wanted to go on Saturday was they have twice a month, they have like open spinning. So you can just come with your spinning wheel and you can just sit there and spin anytime between 10 in the morning and five, what their office or their store hours are. So, but I felt a little shy about just walking in with my spinning wheel. So I, um, cause I wanted to buy fiber that I had picked out instead of only using the fiber that a teacher had given me. I mean, it was great. The teachers were very thoughtful about what kind of fiber they gave us, but I still, I was at the point now, I want to pick out something myself. So I walked in there and this woman immediately stood up. Oh, hello, welcome. You know, have you ever been here? I said, no, I just bought my spinning wheel a week ago. And she, did you bring it? <laughs> and I said, yeah, it's out in the car. Go get it. So I went and got my wheel and I brought it in and there was another woman who was there with her wheel. She was like, oh, that's my dream wheel. I really want to lend her. I'm like, she recognized it even though it was all folded up. Uh, so I set it up and then I, I went around and I looked at, at some fiber and I bought this green, I don't know that the uh, light is going to be 
right for this, but it's this green, it's really, I can't, it's this kind of variegated green, there's two or three different colors of green in it. I got four ounces of it. This is only about an ounce and a third. I was unwinding it and dividing it up because this is, I want to try three ply. So I divide it up into three, three bits and I'm spinning. I'm on my second, getting halfway through my second bobbin and then this will be the third bobbin. And what I, it's, it's, 75% Minnesota wool. So it's just some kind of mixture of a bunch of different wools. So, so much from wanting to learn different breeds. And then it's 25% silk. So it's kind of, I would call it a, you know, more of a light green colors. And I started spinning with it and I noticed the color looked different when it was spun into singles. And I was looking at, I was noticing it and I think it's the silk. I, well, it, there's two things. My daughter, who's a graphic design major, I was asking her what she thought the reason was that the color looked different in this version versus as a single. And she just thought it had to do with the transparency. Like a lot of, a lot of light is getting through this fiber. Whereas when I've got it them spun into singles, it's all very dense. There's not much air in there at all. So not much light is getting through there. So when I lay, lay this on the bobbin, they look very similar. They look, it's obviously the same color, but when you look at them separately, they look quite different. So it'd be really interesting to me to see what happens once it's spun into um, a three ply yarn. And then once it's knit up to see the different stages that this goes through and see what I learn about that because I it's you know at first I, I like I was like oh no how will I ever be able to do something like dye something a color that I think I want it to be and then you don't know what it's going to happen to it once it's spun up in the knit um, so that there was this, this over this moment of feeling overwhelmed by that like there's no way to ever learn that but um, I'm just going to see what happens and I'm sure different fibers like with the silk with the reflective nature of silk it probably makes a difference too so that's what I'm going to learn. Now one thing that I did not expect when I started telling people like my friends who aren't knitters or spinners telling them that I would bought a spinning wheel and I was learning to spin the number of people who have said to me, oh, don't poke your finger like Sleeping Beauty. And I was like, what are they talking about? And I think, and, and so of course I went and did some research, which led in a direction that I did, did not expect. Uh, first of all, if I ever saw the Disney Sleeping Beauty, I mean, I've seen clips of it different, but, and I know what the character looks like, but if I ever saw it, it was as a child and I don't remember the Disney version and we didn't have it when my kids were little. Uh, I think because I always thought that was the dumbest fairy tale. Like I love romance, you know, and romance novels, romantic comedies, all of that. Um, but I really prefer a heroine who's actively involved in the relationship instead of one who's unconscious. Uh, and then it's love at first sight for the prince, like it, that it's, it does nothing for me. And I didn't see, there's a more recent movie, Maleficent, I think it's called. And I did, I did, when I was Googling around, I saw a trailer that showed whoever's playing Sleeping Beauty, showing her walking up to a spinning wheel and there's this giant spike sticking up from it. And she, for whatever reason, <laughs> pokes at it and she starts bleeding. So I do remember, like we had fairy tale books when I was a kid, these illustrated fairy tale books that I would read when I'd go visit my dad. And so I do remember that there was like this child, this baby was born and there was all these different fairies who were giving her blessing, like giving her, you know, beauty or this or that, giving her these gifts. And that there was one who, I don't know if she didn't get invited or is, I don't know. She was the evil one. There's always got to be an evil one. 
and she cursed the baby for some reason and then when the curse was enacted and I didn't remember what the curse what caused her to, to fall asleep I just remembered that at some point boom she fell asleep and then it was like a hundred years and then the prince somehow wanders into this castle sees her falls in love kisses her and then she wakes up and they live happily ever after that's what I that's like what I could remember so I started looking I thought well I'll go I'll go look um, on Ravelry one of the spit in the spinning groups and see if anyone talked about Sleeping Beauty like what they were what that was about and there were some discussions about what on earth was she pricking herself on? Like, what kind of spinning device was it that she would have pricked herself on? So people were, well, it's not a treadle, you know, um, a spinning wheel. There's nothing to poke yourself on one of those. Well, maybe it was a walking wheel with the spindle that was pokey, or maybe it was actually a draw, you know, this kind of spindle or that kind of spindle. People were speculating. And, you know, you also have to think about uh, the context of, modern lives at that time when these were first published these stories were published or when they were told to each other so i started looking about the history of sleeping beauty and tried to try to figure out what it, what what was going on i ended up on the wikipedia page on the history of sleeping beauty and then i realized okay this makes a lot of sense okay so when when disney was making that sleeping beauty and then even maleficent or Malef maleficent maleficent whatever it is Nobody now, very few people nowadays know what a spinning wheel looks like. And so if she was pricking herself while spinning, you can create anything that looks like a spinning wheel that people kind of at least know looks like a spinning wheel and that has some pokey on it. Because nobody's going to have any context for, for what, how a spinning wheel works or what the parts are. Most people are not going to have that. And certainly the the creative people aren't going that who are creating this won't know they might hopefully do some research but even then they have to try to figure out how can we take this story where she pricks herself like what is she pricking herself on so i started looking at the history well the brothers Grimm version they, their stories were published in the early 1800s and by then a treadle spinning wheel would have been widely known in europe and there is nothing, like I said, on a treadle spinning wheel that you could poke yourself on. But then their stories were based on this guy, I think in France from a couple hundred years ago. And then there was a previous version, maybe in Italy in the 1500s. So the further back in time you go, the different sort of spinning implements you're going to have that people are going to know about and so it changes what it is that she is pricking herself on there are some versions where she's pricking herself on this it says it's a spindle or a distaff which is something that holds the fiber when you are working um, on a great wheel so there was something that was just poking and then some people were speculating one well, made just a splinter on the thing like wouldn't have been wonderfully sanded down wood she could have gotten a splinter off that well if you go back far enough there are two parts to the sleeping beauty story that that are important and that change one is what is it that causes the curse to take effect like what is she doing that sends the sensor in, into this deep sleep and that's the thing that spinners are focused on, which is, you know, is it the just staff? Is it a splinter? Is it a this? Is, a, is it a that? And then there's the thing that causes her to come out of her sleep. So the Brothers Grimm were the very first ones to say that it was the prince's kiss that, would, that caused her to wake up. It was a little way <laughs> different than that um, previously. So when you go back far enough, it turns out that she was spinning flax and she got a splinter up underneath her fingernail so it wasn't the the tool that she was using that caused her to get um, poked it was the material that she was spinning and so she had gotten this splinter and and it also turns out that this prince or sometimes king who finds her isn't kissing her he's basically assaulting an unconscious um, woman and and so in this original story she um, she gets cursed she gets the splinter under her fingernail and after the prince 
has uh, found the sleeping woman and decided to have his way with her uh, and leaves. She didn't wake up from that. Uh, nine months later, she gives birth to twins, still unconscious. And then one of the twins, you know, suckles on her finger, pulls the splinter out. And then she wakes up and is like, what? I have twins? And it isn't until later that this guy, this prince or king, decides to visit her again. And he's like, oh, she's awake with twins. So anyway, this was not what I thought I was going to find out when I was <laughs> looking to see what people meant when they said, don't prick your finger on your spinning wheel. So that was a little bit of, of early morning horror on Wikipedia. When I was at this fiber co-op, so I bought this green fiber. I was really happy with it. I sat down. I started spinning with it. Um, I've been really happy with it. I'm excited at uh, after looking at the woolen spinning thing about help. I've got some tools for procedures for making my singles more consistent. Really happy with that. I made one other purchase at that co-op. And it's the sort of purchase that just reminds me of my early days of knitting when I impulsively bought yarn or impulsively bought the materials for a project and then didn't realize until later what a dumb idea, what, either because I, I, I would never wear this finished item or I don't wear those colors or, you know, I, I made so many mistakes, which is why I have learned not to stash yarn because I it's just, I just know I know when I'm going to make a mistake that way. So I'm looking around the shop. I have the green stuff. I looking around and I see this bag of black yarn and it's the bag is open. And I reach in to touch it. It is so soft. It's just so soft. And it was like an immediately I'm very tactile that way. And immediately it was like I love this. And I I don't know enough about, and it's just like wool. It's lamb's wool. First of all, it's black, black lamb's wool. I don't buy black yarn because it's so difficult to see what I'm doing. And it was very soft, but I get home and I start looking at it. And basically I think what it was, it was lamb's wool that was sheared prior to the lamb probably being processed as meat because it was not a full year's worth of, of wool. It's like two inches long. It's, it's so short. And I was like, I don't know if I can even do anything with this. So I went to the textile center yesterday and decided to try to use the drum card or try to remember how to use the drum card from when I learned in my spinning class. And either, either I should have used the other, they have a drum card that's meant for fine um, yarns. And I don't know if this qualifies as that. It's just very short. And so basically I, I tried making a bat from it and I thought it's just so much of it stayed on the, it's called the liquor in. It's like the small cylinder with spikes that draws the fiber in and then it puts it on a great, on, a, on the, the drum, the big one is called the Swift, I believe. So much it was staying on the liquor and, and it was, and then I started thinking about all this black fiber stuck to this drum and the next person who comes in with natural fiber. I spent so long trying to getting all the fiber off. I got a vacuum. They have a vacuum there. I'm like vacuuming every, every, until what I was getting off of there were long natural colored fibers from whoever had been there before me. But it was, it was, it was a learning experience. But what it taught me was that I, before I buy washed or unwashed, you know, raw fleece, or even if it's washed, I need to learn more about what I'm looking for uh, before I can buy that. Because I really want to go to a wool festival this summer and um, be able to buy a fleece and know what I'm looking for. So I have some goals <laughs> um, for how I think I'm, I can do that. Um, one is I want to get better at using the drum carter. So I want to use an appropriate fiber. Uh, I might try it with um, this Romney because I didn't, I didn't do much with the Romney and it, it's a, it seems like a more appropriate fiber. I don't know if I even have enough of it for that. I have enough to do hand carding. Um, but so I, I'm thinking what I want to do is buy 
two to four ounces of washed fibers, some kind of fibers, different wools. Split it up and then uh, card some of it and comb some of it. Spin it up into and practice doing these sample cards and figuring out uh, what I want to do and practice with my plying. Then compare the carded versus combed yarns and, tr and you know, just do some systematic. You use the same drawing method, but drafting method, but you know, having one that, you know, the two different preparations, just so I can kind of systematically learn. Maybe I'll do that like once, a, you know, this week I'll do this one and this week I'll do that one. So that by the time I get to my advanced beginner spinning class at the end of July, I can have some specific goals that I can have the teacher help me with. And then once that class is over, my, um, that week following, I'm going to Michigan to visit family and there's a big wool festival that they were telling me about at the co-op. They go, oh, if you, cause the woman who runs the co-op is originally from Michigan as well. And she goes, oh, if you ever get a chance, go to that wool festival. It's, you know, it's really a great one. So that's kind of my plan is that by the time I get to that wool festival, I will know what I need to know in order to buy a fleece. And I will also do perhaps some experiments on, on um, which products I'm going to use to wash that fleece. So I love answering the questions that people have been posing for me um, to discuss here on Casual Friday. So if you have a similar question or a quite different question, um, let me know down in the comments below or over in Ravelry. If you have just a question about a project that you're working on, you'd like some advice, do ask over in Ravelry, create a new topic over there. It's not so scary to do. Uh, and then I'll see it there and people can learn from it. I'll, I always answer those questions, but it also gives other people in the group the opportunity to um, say their experiences because I don't have every every knitting experience in the world and sometimes people have suggestions that I would never think of. It's a really great great place to get questions answered. It's a little bit more intimate than trying to navigate the, the major forums but those are a great place as well. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.